And here it is, Episode 9, Part 2. We're on the Telluride side. I already walked you through the town of Ure. I already brought you up to Imogene Pass and all the way to the peak. You've seen some of the wildlife. I've shown you the spectacular waterfalls on the Ure side. I've shown you some of the amazing views from the peak of the mountain. And you've seen the Jeep people. Yeah. We went up there during a storm. We saw some shenanigans. I reported on them properly, I thought. And then... Bleeding and damaged in numerous spots. Attacked by red ants. Yeah, things got a little wacky on the Telluride side, which is why I had to make this a two-part video. So you're going to want to sit back, you're going to want to relax, and you're most definitely going to want to check this out. Okay, in part one, I had just reached the top of Imogene Pass, 13,200 feet. Now, I've done this trail several days in a row. This was one day when it was actually clear. But in part one of this video, if you remember, visibility was slightly different and all sorts of shenanigans were breaking loose during this storm. And fortunately, I was there to document most of it for posterity, we'll call it. It seems that the worse the weather got, the rules all went out the window. And I caught a lot of flack for pointing out the rules. The ones that Colorado has, not the ones that I made, but on that, I'll digress. I started my descent into Telluride. This is where I'm going. And this is on a nice day. It's a long, storied, well-traveled road. When I come down on the Telluride side, I'm in four-wheel low, low. I let the truck crawl, because why not? The roads are fairly tight, but totally doable, nothing too shaky at all. But the view is epic, and this is what I'm here for. This is where you unplug from the rest of the world and actually see maybe a sliver of the Garden of Eden, or whatever. But this right here is gear oil for the soul, as I like to call it. Now I've already gone through the entire history of this trail in the video I did last year, which I'm showing right here, and I'll leave a link above for you so you can check it out. A lot of people have watched this video. But for the people that haven't watched the video, I'll give you a quick rundown of the Telluride side of Imogene Pass. Imogene was used as a busy mining road that connected two mining valleys. It was opened as a tourist route for four-wheel drive vehicles in 1966. A fort was built, Fort Peabody, in 1904 by the Colorado National Guard at the top of the pass to prevent Union miners from crossing during a labor strike. It's all about that money. The first long-distance power line was built over Imogene Pass to transport electricity from the town of Telluride to the Camp Bird Mine in the early 20th century. The more you descend the trail, 
the more the stones and rocks give way to grassy fields and meadows in the middle of the valley. And a lot more wooden and stone structures begin to show themselves. It's really quite remarkable. This is a long descent. You have to remember that you're ascending from 13,000 feet, so it takes quite a while to get down here. And there's a lot of different ways you can go, so pick your lane carefully. Obviously, to get this footage, I pulled over a lot. As you're exploring, bear in mind there are open mine shafts here and there, as well as rusty nails and all sorts of ankle twisters. So pay attention when you're hiking. The old buildings, the old housing quarters, the old processing plants, everything they did, everything they built to make this a mining community is pretty much still here, albeit in a skeletonized form. But it's amazing how long these things have stood the test of time. These buildings being down here in this valley are subject to incredible forces of nature and it's astonishing to me what still remains after all this time. This stuff was all built in the late 1800s, early 1900s, and it's still here. Now, with, with that being said, some of the buildings that were here last year have degraded due to storms, blizzards, wind, etc. But for the majority, most things are still standing troughs for the horses, buckets and carts used to transport iron ore, silver, gold, etc. Whatever it was they were mining that particular time, because it varies. Every place you look, there's machinery and pieces of the mining community left scattered all about. It looks like trash, but it's actually history, so there's that. As you explore the area, you'll notice there's a lot of running water. Do not drink that water. If you drive through this water, it'll leave a residue on your truck that's difficult to get off. It's all runoff from the old mining camps that were there, and I would not recommend in any way drinking that water. There's a public service announcement for you. Now here's another public service announcement. You're still not down the trail yet, and when you come to a place where you can't see over the end, go take a look. Because on this particular trail right here, if you go to the right, it's an entirely different experience than going to the left. There's a lot of places on this descent where there's advanced rock outcroppings, we'll call it, and then the trail is usually to the left or the right. If you're not ready to go over some seriously off-center, off-camber, really rocky shelves, you might want to take a few minutes and get out and check the trail first. Most people don't. Now at this point in the trail, there's no chance of flipping over the side unless you're an absolute idiot. And that could be the case. But it's very steep and it's very winding and I watched so many people going down this standing on their brakes. If you're in a four-wheel drive vehicle, you have four-wheel low. Use four low. Let the gears do the work. You're going to need your brakes at some point. You do not want to fade them out or heat them up to the point where they're useless. Do you see what I'm saying? So now you've made it to the bottom of the valley and drink it in. You're surrounded by alpine forest, mountain tops, hopefully blue skies, but it doesn't really matter. And you are surrounded by the remnants of the mining camps, the military camps, etc. They're all around you in every direction. And if you've made it this far, you're one of I'm going to guess we're probably 1% of the population that's ever been down here or ever seen this. Take your time, take pictures, walk around, look at it. But again, be careful because you're basically walking through 
dilapidated buildings with rusty nails and such sticking out everywhere. Just be cautious. If you've made it this far, chances are you're not an idiot. Now, real quick, for the people that just cringed when I said the word idiot, Jailbreak Overland does not participate or recommend political correctness. If you want to destroy a country, make everybody afraid to speak political correctness. And that's how you do it. Another public service announcement brought to you by the Ridgeway Lodge, where I'm editing this video right now. So once you're at the bottom of the valley, there's only one other way to go, and that's out to Telluride. But before you do that, you are surrounded by skeletonized remains of mining camps, camp quarters, processing plants, everywhere. There, there's, it's almost overwhelming how much there is here, but I really did take the time to go around. For those people that can no longer make it or will never make it here, this is what it takes all the time, energy, and money to get out here just to see stuff like this. This is stuff you don't read about in the history books, etc. And yet this is what actually built the West for the most part. Trapping and mining is what made America. These guys were out here turning ginormous alpine logs into sleeping quarters. These things are 17 to 20 inches in diameter. These are massive logs and they're still standing, I mean, for the most part. Modern contractors couldn't even imagine having to build something using simple, simple hand tools. A saw, an ax, an ox, a mule, rope, to build things like this. These are amazing structures, and the fact that they're in the valley of a mountain pass is serious. And as you're about to hit the trail to actually head down into the town of Telluride, that's where it gets really good. This is the processing part, from what I can deduce, of the mining operation, based on the fact that there are large ovens here, tons of carriages that came down on railroad tracks with the ore in it, you can still see the base of the chimney that was used to smelt or melt the iron ore into a more, I don't know, more convenient medium to transport off the mountain. But it's all still standing right here. You can see the rivers next to it that actually turned wheels, that turned turbines, etc. It's pretty amazing. And the fact that they built this in a really harsh environment is badass. Stuff you really don't see people doing anymore, sadly, but it is what it is. Technology moves on and things like this are just left behind, scattered in a mountain valley for only a few people to see. Well, you know what? You've seen it now, and I've seen it numerous times, and it never fails to impress me whatsoever. I'd rather be doing this than watching men dressed in tight clothing chasing each other around about a ball or watching lame nonsense on the television, something I haven't owned in nine years now. But enough of that. Let's digress, shall we? Time to head down and into Telluride. The trail is not over yet, and the trail actually gets rather dangerous if you get careless right now. And as far as my travels go, this was my third day on Imogene Pass, and I was out of the woods, so to speak. I'm good to go. I'm going to be in Telluride by 5 o'clock. I'm going to grab myself a decent meal. All is well. My job basically is done. Or so I think. Now as you can see, it's still a long way to get off the trail. But I'm just sucking it up now. I'm just getting really good footage, any beautiful views. I'm trying to get them on film, etc. No big deal. I've done this trail a half a dozen times. What could possibly go wrong? Now remember, even though it seems like you've made it through the forest and through the woods and you're on your way to grandmother's house, there's still a lot of trail left. And this side of the trail, the actual exit down into the town of Telluride, is where several vehicles have gone, off, off, gone over the side in the last few years. 
Actually, one happened last year. An older couple in a Jeep went over the side, and it was ugly. It happens. So stay on alert, and there's a lot of places where there's blind curves here and oncoming traffic coming in from Telluride. road is really tight, as you can see. It's a one-lane road in almost all places going into Telluride. The biggest problem is don't get distracted looking at all the remnants of buildings and things on the side. Too many people stop in the middle of the trail and don't pay attention to the fact that they're on the other side of a blind turn. Things like that. Just be incredibly aware of your surroundings and you'll be good to go. Getting this footage on this portion of the trail was really difficult with the drones because now I'm coming down in elevation and more trees are showing up, as you can see. But being the consummate YouTuber that I am, I remained flying the drone and driving the vehicle, all for your viewing pleasure, back at home. The amount of historic and antique debris littering the trails on both sides is very distracting. And when you stop to look at it, if you choose to do that, be very cautious of where you are. Make sure you're not right on the other side of a turn. Make sure if somebody does come around the turn, they have the opportunity to see you. Because even on this descent right here, there's still a lot of trail left to go. But again, there's also a lot of history right here and it's very attractive, especially to somebody with a camera. It's all around you, basically. You really can't miss it. And bear in mind, not only is this road tight, curvy, tons of blind spots, but it's very, very rocky and off camber, which is why people tend to go over this. When they made it all the way through Imogene Pass to this point, they think they're out of the woods, so to speak, and they are not whatsoever at all. Anything can happen on Imogene Pass if you're not paying attention. Things like, I don't know, this for instance, I am so close to the town of Telluride, I can taste the cheeseburgers from a local diner already. I am out of the woods. This is all just gravy now. So I'm getting the last piece of footage before I won't be able to fly anymore because there's far too many trees. 
I readjust the drone, I readjust the steering wheel, I come around one of the final tight turns, and wait for it, wait for it, boom. That is up the side of a 70 foot incline on a mountainside. And I just uploaded all my cameras to my laptop the night before, except for the one drone with 20 hours of 4K 60 frame per second footage in it. The drone that I just crashed. Now I've got four drones for just this occasion. The only issue is all the best footage is in that drone. The controller that I use backs it all up, but it backs it up in 1920 by, 30, by 340, and that's terrible resolution. So I look for it real quick. Now before you turn off the video because you say to yourself, I don't wanna watch somebody looking for a drone, let me tell you what, looking for the drone was the most difficult thing I have ever done. Every time I put my foot down, the rocks fell away because I was on a grade this steep. I got attacked by red ants. I almost fell off the mountain twice. Every time I got to the top, it started to rain and I had to come back down. So just for the entertainment value, you're gonna wanna stick around or don't, your call. Oh, and I'm in the middle of nowhere. I'm on the side of a mountain trying to find a drone that's this big using a can using a screen that's this big to try to determine what tree branch best associates with the tree branches up there and while I'm doing this ducking and dodging the weather trying not to slide down and kill myself trying to get all the red ants off of me some people from the city dro drive up in a jeep stop directly where I am this far from me and a woman proceeds to have an absolute panic attack. A shit show breaks out. Because wherever I'm at, either an asshole is gravitated towards me or drama is gravitated towards me. So you're gonna wanna see this. It's actually probably the best part of the video, but I digress. Plus, I'm gonna show you really awesome footage of the cutest little fox puppy ever. So we are on Operation Drone Recovery for the third time. This time, I just straight crashed it. And I'll tell you what, I'm so glad I got the DJI Smart Controller because I was coming down that and the drone went. It's either there or there. One of the two. Now I gotta climb, I mean, we're, I'm at 11,000 feet, so I got no breath as it is. I gotta get up there. It's in one of those two trees. Unbelievable. But I ain't giving up. Not now, man. That drone's got the high def footage on it. It, it. it would just eat me alive if I didn't go and find it. So there's that. And I can't find it at all. I try to recreate it. I can't find it at all. So I give up because it's getting dark and I'm out of here. Okay, I've been searching for the drone for over an hour and a half. The sun is starting to set. So... I'm gonna head out of here. Now I've got... I've got all the footage backed up in... regular definition on the controller. But I got it 4K 60 frames a second on the drone. And the drone is here. It's here. It's just a matter of finding it. But I'm still at 10,500. I gotta go down another 1,500 feet. It's 630. I saw how the weather went from nice to brutal yesterday. I'm not going to take any chances, I guess. I don't know. But I was planning on rolling out in the morning. Yeah. I'm not good at leaving things behind, no matter what they are. The 
Unless they're an ex-girlfriend, I'm I'm good like that. I'll I'll walk in a heartbeat if it's a bad situation. So there's that. Man, I lost my drone. That bums me out, dude. I just want the footage. That's it. Drone? I don't give it. Don't matter to me. There's another drone on a there's another drone sitting at a subscriber's house right now. And I was going to give her son the one I just lost. Sorry, kid. So I give up. I go home. Oh, I, I go wherever I slept that night. And it's bothering me. It's the albatross around my neck. It's the proverbial raven rap tap tapping at my door. I can't stop thinking about this stupid drone. I've got the footage. I spent an hour and a half looking for the drone. I can't find it. Just give it up. Let go. Walk away. I've walked away so many times in my life with no problems, but this just bothered me. So it's 8 o'clock Saturday morning. I just woke up, so I slept pretty late. It was cold last night, so it was good sleeping weather. And I'm in Ure, Colorado, and I'm... I shouldn't say I'm trying to, to decide if I'm going back to tell you right. I am. I gotta find that drone. So it's Saturday morning, and when you just get off the phone with your father to tell him you're going to do something exceptionally stupid, you're going to do something stupid. That's the mountain range from that end all the way up to the other end is where I've traveled the last two days. Now I'm taking a shortcut this morning I'm going right back to the end of the trail, almost the end of the trail, where I lost the drone. Because even though I had the footage backed up, it's in such low definition that it would kill me not to go back and again try to find the drone. So that's exactly what I'm going to go do. So good luck, right? So of course, I roll out at 8 o'clock this morning and the sky is beautiful, beautiful weather. And by the time I get to the location, storm clouds have gathered. So hopefully it just passes quickly and it's not a monster soaking rain. Coming up that trail, I see another land cruiser and the kid's yelling at me, I think he's in danger. He's not. He's a subscriber. Had his girl or wife take a picture with me, which is weird, but everyone does it. So the drone is someplace right up there. And I have a twig and a leaf as a marker. I spent six and a half hours total up here looking for this drone. I did these time-lapse videos just while I was searching anyway. Each one of them takes 150 minutes per. The weather changed so many times it was ridiculous. But again, that's how the weather works on a mountain. And if you're going to head up a mountain, know that and act accordingly. Or don't. Your call. It's terrific timing because the rain has started, but I think I have it narrowed down. Looking at this branch right here, I think I know where it is. So with all that information at my disposal, I reluctantly headed up this. Now, I can't even explain how steep this thing is. Every time I put my foot down, the rocks moved. I was holding on to, to shrubs and tree branches for dear life. 
and I searched for this thing. And once I started, I just did not want to give up. I knew it was up there, just didn't know exactly where it was up there. But I looked, and I looked. I ambled around up there on my hands and knees like a bear rooting for grubs in the soil. I literally beat the bushes. Now I understand what that old fashioned term means. I searched high and low. Every time I got up there, storm clouds, as you can see, moved in. It was like a joke. Finally, I broke out another drone and started searching the area from the sky, which means I had to fly the drone and then take the SD card out, upload it to a laptop on the back of my truck, which is parked at a 45 degree angle because I'm on the side of a mountain, and I had to scrub through the footage. I even took the drone and tried to recreate the exact same crash to see if I would end up in the ballpark. And then these people showed up. The guy sitting on the corner, I just walked him through the trail. I just convinced him it was better to pull over than back down the trail. While this convoy of vehicles came by and parked within a foot of my truck. Now I've been parked there for five hours and they just pulled up like I wasn't even there. And the problem was the woman in the green tank top was having a panic attack and she was screaming at the driver because he told her this was a simple shelf road. After a while of me convincing him that it was better for him to turn around now and bring her down as opposed to continue going on because he read someplace that this was an easy, quick trail. She was already freaking out at 10,000 feet. Imagine at 13,000. They took my advice and headed back down the road, but it was amazing to me how they stopped there. All this drama played out as though I wasn't set up. I mean, you can see I've got tripods, my truck set up, my laptop's out. I'm clearly doing something. They pulled up like I wasn't even there. This is my third and final attempt up on foot. I'm having zero luck locating this thing. But back up I went. This time I brought a bipod or a monopod made of carbon fiber that I use as a camera stand as something to actually keep my balance up there. I can't even explain to you how precarious it was up there. It was straight down. This was not a hiking trail. And I'm going through the thorns and I'm going through all sorts of things that are scraping me and cutting me and making me bleed. And then I realized I've got a bunch of thorns in my ankle and it's killing me. And I look down and what I thought was just a bunch of thorns stuck in my ankle, like were stuck in my arm and etc., weren't thorns at all. They were red ants all over me. Phenomenal. So that sucked and then I almost fell. So with five and a half hours under my belt, covered with rips and tears from rocks and thorns and red ants and every other thing that I scraped myself across, I started going way, way, way over to the left, a good 40 yards away from where I was positive the drone crashed. I was all out of places to look for, and I was already up there, I already got attacked by red ants. So what else could possibly go wrong? I kept looking and then I had an idea. I remembered that when Fred Flintstone was the, his alter ego, Superstone, giving out that particular cry always gave him good luck. bleeding and damaged in numerous spots. Attacked by red ants. Those all dried up last night. It's no joke up there. That's not a hiking trail. It's the side of a cliff and every time you put your foot down, it moves. But I did it. And I did it for you people and America. Trump's not coming back. Indeed he isn't, because politics isn't real, and you should know that by now. 
But at any rate, after all the blood, sweat, and tears, I finally found my drone, which allowed me to make this video, and you probably figured that out quite a while ago. But the thing that I take away from this entire trip was, when you lose a drone on a mountainside, summoning Fred Flintstone is obviously the answer. And people that own Jeeps still suck. Every one of them drove by, not one of them stopped and said, Hey, do you need any help? Because you'd think that if you saw a vehicle parked on the side of the road. I do it to everyone. Most people do it to everyone. But on this particular morning, I was alone. If you enjoyed this video, make sure you hit that like, share, and subscribe. Leave a comment below, and I will try to return the favor. I am out.